2022 season kicked off in rather rare fashion. Week 1 featured Joe Flacco, Baker Mayfield, and Russell Wilson lining up against their former teams. Just one of these matchups is unique. Three in one week is absurd. Seeing a guy that was the face of one's franchise for years all of a sudden line up against them is surreal. And hearing the fans' reaction, like what Russell Wilson received in Seattle, is unlike anything else in sports. This sparked a debate in comment sections all across the internet about whether or not it's appropriate to boo, given what a guy like Wilson had done for Seattle. You can leave your opinions on the matter down below. As far as the games themselves, these three quarterbacks all lost to their previous franchises. This left me curious. What other times in NFL history has well-known quarterbacks faced off against their former teams? And if it was a home game, what were the fans like? And how did these games go? We will get into it after a word from today's sponsor, SeatGeek. Football season is well underway, and let me explain how SeatGeek, a longtime partner on this channel, works. They gather tickets from all across the web and put them into one area, making buying simple. They have everything from football, baseball, basketball, concerts, festivals, or more. And with football season back, why not go to one of your local college or NFL games? The atmosphere is unlike any other. Seagy rates every ticket from 0 to 10 to make sure that you're getting a good deal, with green meaning good and red meaning bad. And for first time buyers, use code KTO at checkout for $20 off your first purchase. Make sure to click the link in the description to download the app. Joe Montana was the man of the 80s. Four Super Bowl rings, three Super Bowl MVPs, two regular season MVPs, and overall was the biggest star in the NFL. But in the twilight of his career, Montana suffered a serious elbow injury in 1991 that kept him out well into the next season. By the time he returned, Steve Young had taken on the reins, and the team was moving forward with him instead of Montana. When Montana was back and healthy, tension arose before the 1993 season, as both quarterbacks expected to be the starter and nothing less. Montana eventually requested a trade, which landed the biggest star quarterback of the 80s in Kansas City. After 14 years and so much success with the Niners, Joe Montana led an excellent first season in Kansas City, going 8-3 as the starter, and led the team to the AFC Championship game. At the same time, the Niners had reached the NFC Championship game, meaning that if both of these teams could advance to the Super Bowl, this would have easily been the most anticipated matchup of all time. Unfortunately, they both lost. They didn't have to wait long after that to face off though, as the Chiefs and Niners were scheduled to play in week two of the following season. This had developed into must-watch television. The game was played in Kansas City, and legend has it that most Niners fans at bars were cheering for Joe Cool to beat their own team. Ultimately, the game started off with Montana leading a touchdown drive, and he went on to have a two touchdown performance as he led the Chiefs to a 24-17 win over his former team. This would be the only time he faced the 49ers. Some other significant quarterbacks roughly around the same time included Warren Moon and Randall Cunningham. Moon played 10 years in Houston, and despite making five Pro Bowls in a row, they traded him to Minnesota. Moon would play six more years in the NFL and only got the opportunity to go against his previous team once. This happened in 1995. The former Oilers quarterback beat his old franchise in an overtime thriller with nearly 300 yards and two touchdowns. For Cunningham, he played 11 seasons in Philly before being demoted to the backup, then retiring after the 1995 season. But then he returned in 1997, taking the place of, who else, Warren Moon in Minnesota. Cunningham, unfortunately, never got the chance to play against Philly as a member of the Vikings. It wasn't until 2000, when Cunningham joined the Cowboys, that he got his chance to start against Philadelphia in week 10. According to the announcers, this was how he was received. I'd say he was received with a mixture of cheers and boos. He played 11 years here. I would say that there were more cheers there than there were boos though. I think you're right. In a low scoring game, Cunningham only passed for 109 yards and no touchdowns in a 16-13 loss. This was his one and only start versus his former team. That day, he had gone against young second year starter Donovan McNabb 
who accomplished something in Philly that Cunningham did not. McNabb would eventually lead the Eagles to the Super Bowl in 2004. Now, despite losing that game, this dude's impact on the organization was a profound one. He made it to six Pro Bowls in his 11 years playing in Philly before they decided to move on to Michael Vick, and they traded McNabb to division rival Washington. It wasn't long before he made his appearance back in Philly Stadium. In week four of the 2010 season, McNabb was first met with cheers, then boos, as he helped beat his old team 17-12, although he wasn't very impressive that day. The next time these two teams faced was a completely different story. Michael Vick popped off that day for six total touchdowns, but of course, he didn't get his start in Philly, as most of you know. For a few solid years, Vic was the most electrifying player in the NFL as a member of the Falcons. But then he went to prison for two years, the Falcons moved on, and Vic joined the Eagles in 2009. Although he was used sparingly that year, he did make his return to Atlanta and scored two of his three touchdowns that year in that game. Now, as for him starting for the Eagles, Vic lost the two times that he played versus the Falcons. In the same year that Vic joined the Eagles, Brett Favre joined the Vikings. Funny enough, both of these guys were drafted by Atlanta, but of course, Favre never started a game for them and he went on to start for Green Bay for 16 years. It wasn't until Favre announced his retirement in March 2008 that the team officially moved onto their developing young quarterback, Aaron Rodgers. But Favre's retirement only lasted four months, and when he came back, he was eventually traded to the Jets, where Favre played for one year, retired, then unretired all over again. That's when he joined the Vikings. The man that was once met with cheers was now an enemy, and in the words of Brett Favre, I wanted to play for anyone who would play the Packers. Minnesota played him twice. Brett's wishes would come true rather quickly on what became the most watched Monday night football broadcast in ESPN's history, Favre put together an excellent three touchdown performance and overall Minnesota dominated. Then just four weeks later, Brett returned to Lambeau in purple. He played incredibly well once again, throwing for four touchdowns and no interceptions as Minnesota again bested Green Bay. The Packers got the last laugh. Favre would throw a classic Favre interception in the NFC Championship that season. Then the following year, Green Bay dominated the series against Favre, and Aaron Rodgers was beginning to shine. The torch had officially been passed, and Green Bay would go on to win a Super Bowl that year, while Favre would retire after a tough season. The opposite of this story came true for Drew Brees, who went on to win a Super Bowl for his second team, while the team that drafted him still has not. Breeze only played five years in San Diego before he suffered a substantial shoulder injury and the team moved on to Phillip Rivers. Breeze would go on to sign with the Saints. He didn't get his chance to play against his former team until 2008, where he helped the Saints win, putting up over 330 yards and three touchdowns. He actually didn't even play in San Diego until 2016, which was over a decade since he had suited up for them. Again, he led the Saints to victory and overall, in the four contests between the two, Breeze never lost to the Chargers. Peyton Manning told us last night, this is not a game I ever thought I'd play in or wanted to play in, but the time is here and now. That's the face of a man who looks sick to his stomach. Peyton Manning, in 2013, returned to Indianapolis to take on his former team. For the better half of 13 years, Peyton Manning was arguably the best player in the NFL with 11 Pro Bowls and four MVPs during that time, but a serious neck injury prior to the 2011 season made it appear as if Manning's football career was possibly over. After not playing in the season opener, he would get surgery the following day, and he sat out for the entire year. If there was ever a season that showed a player's value, just look at the Colts' record with and without Manning. After 2011, Indianapolis possessed the number one pick, and they were in line to take the best prospect in seemingly decades. 
With the uncertainty of Manning's situation, the team released him before the 2012 draft, and he would go on to sign with Denver, where he proved he could still play at an extremely high level. In the middle of his record-setting 55 passing touchdown season, he had his first return to Indianapolis. Manning was met with an ovation from the crowd prior to the game, which left him emotional. Despite throwing for over 400 yards and three touchdowns, Luck and the Colts got a big lead and held on to defeat Manning and the Broncos. Side note, this was also the same game as Pat McAfee's famous hit on Trenton Holiday. But anyways, Peyton played four years in Denver, and he faced his old team four total times, going one and three in those games. The final one came in the 2014 playoffs, where the Colts came into mile high and took the W. Peyton did go out on top though, winning a Super Bowl the following year in his final game. So both Drew Brees and Peyton Manning managed to win Super Bowls, while their previous teams have not done that since. In much more rapid succession, Matt Stafford played 12 years in Detroit before being traded to LA. Then he beat his former team with a three touchdown performance, and he went on to win a Super Bowl in his first season out of Detroit. Most of these dudes played a long time with their former teams. Stafford played 12 years in Detroit, Manning spent 13 in Indy, and Brett Favre lasted a whopping 16 in Green Bay. But of course, one quarterback on this list lasted even longer than that. Most of us don't even remember an NFL without this guy. Tom Brady wore that Patriots number 12 uniform for 20 years. After achieving six Super Bowl rings, most of us just assumed that he was going to retire as a Patriot. But after the 2019 season, and closing in on age 43, Brady chose to not re-sign, and shockingly, joined Tampa Bay. And in year one, he proved yet again why he's the GOAT, winning another Super Bowl. Meanwhile, the Patriots trying to rebuild failed to make the playoffs. Following his seventh Super Bowl, Brady returned for his second year in Tampa, and 22nd overall. On the Bucks' schedule that year was the matchup we were all waiting for. In week four, Brady was set to make his return to Foxborough. We finally got the chance to see him face Bill Belichick for the very first time, and also his replacement, Mac Jones. At first, he was met with an ovation. Then the booze came. Well, you know, he, he, he got a tremendous ovation, I would say six to one in favor. But now that the game has started, enough of the romance, they want the Patriots to win the game. The game was a rainy and ugly one. In a low scoring game, midway through the fourth, Brady had no touchdowns and an interception. With just less than five minutes to play, the Patriots hit a field goal to take the lead. Now, if you are a New England fan, this had to be a surreal experience. They were about to watch Brady attempt to put together a game-winning drive late in the fourth, something that he had done so many times for them. And in classic Brady fashion, he didn't play all that well all game long, but when it mattered most, he got the Bucks into field goal range and the kicker made the kick, and the Bucks went on to win by two. 